Hello, we will be using Noon Setting of Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For our song, let's use Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your advers adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <clears throat> Checking things a little bit. Our reading, our text for meditation, is from Revelation chapter 17, starting at verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials, and he talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters and with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, so that the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the wine of her fornication. And he carried me away into the wilderness in the spirit, and I saw a woman sitting upon a rose-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, which had ten horns. And the woman, and the woman was arrayed in purple and rose color, and decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, and had a cup of gold in her hand, full of abominations with her filthiness of her fornication. 
and in her forehead a name was written, A mystery, great Babylon, the mother of whoredom, and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the wife drunk, the wife drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great marvel. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, have mercy. This particular translation, uh, well, it's uh, done in a northern style English, so I will say that uh, throughout the only woman referred to in these uh, six verses is who we refer to as uh, the whore of Babylon or the prostitute of Babylon. Um, uh, she is arrayed in purple and scarlet or purple and rose color, as it says here. Uh, the beast itself is rose-colored, scarlet, and uh, that's what's going on. So, <clears throat> John is being shown this vision of the woman. Uh, this is starting up a new section of Revelation. So, you, so we had uh, the initial vision of Jesus Christ in uh, chapter 1, and Jesus then uh, told John to write down seven letters to seven churches which was uh, chapters 2 and 3. John then was able to look into heaven uh, and uh, see uh, not only the state of heaven, uh, the, uh, the revealedness of heaven, which is in contrast to the Old Testament. So John in Christ is able to see more than the Old Testament prophets. Chapter 5 is when uh, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God, ascends into heaven. So this is the ascension. And he begins uh, the what what we might call uh, the uh, the end of the world, <laughs> and this is more or less what goes on for the rest of the entire book is the uh, revelations of the end of the world and the beginning of the new new heavens and the new earth. However, within that idea of uh, the destruction of the earth and the beginning of the new earth and the new heavens, there are several sections which more or less repeat. So there are three sections of seven, uh, first being seven seals, the second seven angels with trumpets, and the third seven angels with uh, vials or, or uh, cups of God's wrath. Uh, these are the plagues. So within these three groups of seven, each, each, uh, each group sees the world destroyed. In between the second and third group of seven, there's a bit of an interlude. Uh, historical interlude going again back to the ascension of Jesus Christ and then also forward to the end of the world, the end of Satan, the beast of the sea, the beast of the earth, and uh, all their followers. So end of the world there. And then with, seven, with chapter 17 uh, going on to, uh, to the end of the book, actually, uh, this is somewhat of a interweaving and summary of what is going on within the earlier four, vers uh, four visions. Uh, also, a look into uh, what happens when the fullness of, of, of what happens after the end of the world. Now, you'll notice the use of numbers being used here again, with you have three groups of seven, so the sevenly divide in divinely ordained destructions within the earth, and then you also have the fourth vision upon the earth with Satan and the unholy trinity um, for a total of four accounts of the end of the world, uh, four being the number of the world. So three of these are divine. You add the fourth, you have what's going on within the world as the world tries to react against it in the, uh, as seen through the unholy trinity and their followers. So when John goes into this uh, fifth account, he's interweaving these things uh, and what has gone before. And, and we can see this in chapter 17 in these first six verses with uh, the beast, the whore of Babylon is writing. The beast with uh, basically the, the, the seven heads, ten horns, as uh, it is more fully described later on in the next verse in, in verse 7. Uh, we recognize this as the beast of the sea. But wait, hasn't the beast of the sea already been destroyed? 
which which occurred in chapter 15, in uh, actually chapter at the end of chapter 14? Yes, it has already been destroyed. <laughs> the beast has already been destroyed, uh, but we see it again here, here full, fully formed, and with the Whore of Babylon. The Whore of Babylon uh, being basically the enemy of the saints. So it says here in verse 6 that she drinks of the blood of the saints, the witnesses of Jesus Christ. So she's, she's actually representative of, well, you can say, the anti-church or the unholy congregation, um, kind of like the beasts are part of the unholy trinity. So in opposition to the church, uh, she is the one who is uh, acting against the saints. So, uh, all those who are of the faith are in the Church of God, all those who are not of the Church of God, basically the ones who follow the beast, who have the mark of the beast, they are the Whore of Babylon, the ones who are warring against the Church. Now she's ordained with uh, purple and, and scarlet, or rose, uh, gold and precious jewels and pearls, uh, the scarlet, the rose, it's not uh, referring to, say, the, the red, the red district or the, or the uh, district of the city where you would find prostitution. That's not what this is. In ancient, uh, in ancient times, purple and rose were colors of royalty because they were extremely expensive. So basically, she is the one who has wealth in the world, one made wealthy by Satan. Uh, <clears throat> On her forehead is written a mystery, uh, the name of Babylon. Uh, here we see uh, mystery could actually refer to a couple of different things where it's just kind of mysterious, or it's actually referring to what we call mystery religions or uh, religions that are uh, basically against God, trying to subvert themselves away from God, trying to find secret knowledge away from God. Um, Babylon is the enemy which destroyed Jerusalem, uh, leveled Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and is an enemy of the Israelites. So uh, seeing uh, the whore of Babylon as the representative of Babylon, that which destroys uh, God's nations, this is what's going on. <laughs> so we find within this much imagery, a lot of imagery. I've said before, there's a lot of numbers and images in Revelation that we have to decipher, or at least try to decipher or understand. Uh, not that we can possibly understand all things that are happening in the book, but that uh, we are pointed to at various, point, at various other passages in Scripture to try and understand these things. We find the Whore of Babylon being the one set against God, set against specifically his church, much as uh, the beast is against God and against the church. However, we know already through the various visions within the book that uh, the Whore of Babylon does not win. Although she has committed, as it says here in, in, in verse 2, uh, the kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth uh, are drunk in the, the wines of her fornication. Basically, they have made themselves uh, one flesh with her, reference to uh, uh, sexual activity within the marriage relationship, so they have become one with her, uh, and they are uh, drunk on her, drunk on the blood of the saints, so they are joined with her in their, uh, in her sinfulness and also in her opposition to uh, God and his church. However, we find that even though she is the anti-church, what is the true church? Well, the true church is, is those who are joined with Jesus Christ, being made one with him by the Spirit, so that they can be ushered into the marriage feast of the Lamb, which we find much later on in future chapters. So even though we study little bits and pieces of Revelation, it's important that we have the fuller view, the, vol the view which interprets all the numbers, all the images, and sees the whole thing as a whole and not individual parts, so that we could say, oh, this is happening, that's happening, and then we can do this or we could do that, or 
try to find some way to um, uh, put ourselves in or insert ourselves in that we might say, oh, we know exactly what is happening. In truth, we don't know exactly what is happening, not at all times and all places, but we do have a trust in the book of Revelation as a, and whenever we're looking at a part, we should always view it in respect of the whole, which is Jesus Christ saves us. So as John is weaving back and forth in, in between these uh, various events in the book of Revelation, we know that within the greater picture, Jesus Christ saves us. And even though the whore of Babylon, the anti-church, those who are in opposition to the saints, opposition to us, although we know that this exists, we view it in light of the fullness of God's truth, which says, we are in Christ and we will receive the fullness of the new heavens and the new earth, and God will give to us justice. Amen. Uh, we continue with the service of Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296, with the Curie. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we know all things are in your hands, and within the fullness of time you will bring about the end of the world, the second coming of Christ, where we will have the fullness of the new heavens and the new earth, made new, bearing buried with Christ in his baptism and brought in his newness of life, and will find the fulfillment of the newness of life in this new kingdom, in the new heavens and the new earth. Be with us, we pray, Lord, as we but see a small bit of the, this uh, journey to the end within our lives. Be with us and have us view all things within our lives, whether they be as drastic as the COVID virus or as drastic as afflictions to our flesh, flesh that which uh, might uh, cause us to confront our mortality, our own death. Please, Lord, be with us and always guide us to the fullness of your vision in the person of Jesus Christ, seeing in him the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation which is, be which is begun in us and will reach fullness in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, be with us, we pray. Amen. Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, at this hour you run upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms to embrace the world in your death. Grant that all people of the earth may look to you and see their salvation. For your mercy's sake we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.